all across the country. A lot of the top teams are saying, you know what? This is our year. This is our year, and you know what? This is your show. Welcome into the Hard Count, the people show for every single thing that you and I both know and love about this beautiful sport. It happens here every single day, but we are live on Tuesdays and Thursdays as we are right now at 11 a.m. Eastern. We're so glad you're here. You made it. I say it every single show because I think it's important for a lot of y'all. This is your escape, whether it's work, school, ah, summer school, we're right there with you. Whether you're working out, whatever it is, this is your safe place. And so this is a safe place. Like I was just saying right now, we're talking only college football. So sit back, relax, unless you're at the gym finishing up a set. We're glad to be along for the ride. Now, we got a lot to jump into. Like I was just saying, some this is the year teams that we're going to break down in just a minute. I was talking with Josh Newberg before this show started, and I think he said it perfectly. For these teams, the window is open. And we're all on the same page here in college football. The window only stays open so long. So I got four teams we're going to unpack there that I think they, they need to strike right now while the iron is hot. Also, there's been a lot of conversation, a lot of rumblings as we get closer and closer to the season, less than 100 days away now. A lot of people saying, can anyone beat Georgia? <laughs> They've gone back to back. Kirby's just stockpiling talent. Can anyone beat Georgia? Well, I think there's a couple of places we need to look to try and get that question answered. So we'll do that. Then in addition to that, we're going to play some Mythbusters here. Y'all know Mythbusters? Remember that show? I think it was on Discovery, Nick? Discovery Channel, Nat Geo. I don't know what it was on, but we're going to do some Mythbusters when it comes to what's being said about Nick Saban right now. Nick Brake and I actually got into this a little bit yesterday. So if you've been tracking our one-off episodes on this channel, you're probably already in the loop. But we're going to go a little bit more in depth there. Also, Clemson. They're on a recruiting heater right now. They're trending for a lot of top prospects. They have the number 10 class in the on three industry rankings. They just got a commitment yesterday, less than 24 hours ago, from a five-star linebacker out of the state of Georgia in Sammy Brown. It's a big deal now. A lot being said about Dabo, about what he is, what he isn't as a head coach in modern college football has passed him by. Dabo just goes into the state of Georgia, gets a top linebacker. Doesn't sound like he's done just yet. So what does that mean for Clemson? What does that mean for college football in the future? I'm so glad you asked. We'll unpack that in its entirety. Some news, I don't know if broke is the word, some news leaked about a certain Netflix documentary that we've all been clamoring for for a very long time, Swamp Kings about the 2000s Florida Gators and when Urban Meyer was there and Tim Tebow was there and the Pouncey Twins, Aaron Hernandez, we're going to talk about that one and what we want to see and maybe just preview that a little bit for us as we get closer and closer to that one. But like I said, we're so glad you're here. Can't waste any more time. Make sure you like the video if you're tuned in live. We're going to jump right into it with our teams that are saying, you know what? This is our year. So let's get after it. A lot of teams across the country, like we let off the show saying, they were saying, you know what? This is our year. We're not waiting for next year. We're not talking about a rebuild. We're not saying let's get the roster to a certain point. No, no, no. This is the year where you're expecting your team to compete for a conference title and a college football playoff berth. Got a couple of teams here that I want to unpack, but the first one has got to be Michigan. I mean, the Michigan Wolverines, the thing for them is that they got to beat the boss level, right? Because you've done everything else up until this point. A couple of years ago, you would have said, we beat Ohio State. Awesome. That's all we want in this world is to beat the Buckeyes. Well, now you're saying we beat the Buckeyes twice in a row. We've won the Big Ten championship twice in a row. And now you're saying Big Ten title or bust. And you've earned that. It's like when you play the video game and you beat level one, level two, but then you get to the boss level. And you don't care about anything besides beating that boss. And the boss right now for Michigan is a national title. And everything is in Ann Arbor to get it done. The khakis came back, said thanks, no thanks to the NFL. J.J. McCarthy had no choice but to come back. So you got a starting quarterback for the second year in a row now. And then you're going to have Blake Corum back, Donovan Edwards, some key pieces on the outside. Like Michigan has everything there in-house to get it done. They're not looking for 2024 or 2025. And for Michigan, as the Big Ten starts to shift, they're going to add USC and UCLA. This is their chance, I think, to really just plant the maize and blue flag squarely into the ground like they did in Columbus. I don't know if it was a flag plant. They carried the flag to center field. I'll say that much. This is their chance to really stake their claim in the Big Ten and say, no, 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 no. Two years in a row we've won the Big Ten, but now nationally, this, this, is, this is our deal. We run this now. Michigan... Hail to the victors, that's all back. This is their chance to do it. Because if they don't get it done this year, 
then people are going to start to say, hmm, did they peak? Is that all they are? They make the college football playoff twice, and they're, they're you know a good story for two years, but then they kind of run their course. Or is it, no, 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 Michigan's here to stay. This is the chance for them to really do that. And I firmly believe that for Michigan. So for Michigan, this is the year, and a lot of folks in Ann Arbor wholeheartedly agree. Really quickly, make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you've liked the video. Appreciate you in advance for that. I'm not going to ask for anything more. All right? Party rolls on. USC, another team that is saying, you know what? This is the year. Everyone in Los Angeles is saying this had better be the year. You know why? Because Caleb Williams is there for one more season. If you're familiar with this channel, you're familiar with the show, you're familiar with how I feel about USC, it's no secret. Caleb Williams has gone to the league after this year. I don't care how much eligibility he has. He's going to be the top pick taken in the draft. And so for USC, the task before them is, well, can you make sure that you don't waste the opportunity of having Caleb Williams on your roster as your starting quarterback? Because Caleb Williams, just if, if, if everything rode on Caleb Williams, if everything was placed on his shoulders, he is a good enough quarterback to win a national title for you. Now, the beautiful part about football is there is 10 other guys on that field and 11 other guys on your defense that have to do their job. And you notice Lincoln Riley went to the portal and got to work in there. I mean... They added some key pieces. Anthony Lucas from Texas A&M. Barry Alexander from Georgia on the defensive line because the defense last year, not up to par with what the offense is bringing. Allowed almost 30 points a game. Allowed 160 rush yards a game. They were 103rd in the country in terms of allowed conversions on third down. They were 101st in the country in terms of yards allowed per game. So the defense is not holding up their end of the bargain. And the last thing you want to say as a USC fan is, Man, that was awesome. We had Caleb Williams on our team for a little bit there. He won a Heisman Trophy. Heck, maybe he wins two Heisman Trophies. I don't know. It remains to be seen. But you don't want to say he did so many good things, and then they ask you about how your team did, and you say, yeah, well, the team wasn't really up to par with Caleb Williams. Don't tell that story. I know it's only year two for Lincoln Riley, but the portal exists, and he's gone to work in there and gone and gotten what he's wanted, like it's Publix, and he's shopping. Like, this is what USC has built towards, a year like this and a roster like this where they can compete for a national title because it ain't getting any easier. You're going to the Big Ten in 2024, and the college football playoff expands in 2024. So right now you got the quarterback. To be 100% honest with you, you got the, the path there within the Pac-12, it's no shade on the Pac-12. I think it just says a lot about what the Big Ten is right now. Like, this is your opportunity. This is the window for you. Make it happen. I understand you got great quarterbacks on your roster. I believe Malachi Nelson is going to be phenomenal. But Caleb Williams is a one-of-one. One. Do not waste him in Los Angeles. I'm begging you. I'm begging you. And USC, USC fans are right there next to me begging as well. Another team that we got to talk about, how about the Florida State Seminoles? They have been screaming very loudly. This is our year. We've built to this. Mike Norvell has just got some new money. They've built to this. Heck, we'll see if Florida State stays in the ACC. But regardless, same thing I was saying about USC, college football playoff is going to expand. And for Florida State, my question is, if not now, then when? And I think Florida State fans, it's probably floating around in your subconscious. You're kind of thinking the same thing. Jordan Travis is back. Jared Verse is back. We went and got Keon Coleman in the portal. Jaheim Bell in the portal. We have the number one returning production in all of college football from a team that won double-digit games a season ago. If it doesn't happen this year, are we really going to be teed up a whole lot better in the future when we're going to 12 teams and you got to win more games to get to a national title? Like, this is the chance here for Florida State. Now, week one is a college football playoff game in Orlando against LSU. A lot of y'all have been active on Twitter talking about it, and I love you for it. This is the year for Florida State. This is the year you have everything and everyone back, and they've all come back for a reason. Like Jordan Travis probably could have gone to the NFL, probably helps himself by coming back and improving his draft stock. Jared Verse, I firmly believe, could have been a top three round pick. He came back to Florida State to win more football games. Like that's, that's the reality. You went and got these guys through the portal to help yourself have a chance to compete for the college football playoff in 2023. There is no, hmm, in 2024 we'll get there. Hmm, we'll wait till the college football playoff expands and then we'll have a chance. No, it's not what it's about. My good people in Tallahassee, you've suffered the last couple of years and you've been waiting and building for a year like this. You've played the long game. This is the year. The Death Star is fully operational. Florida State, this is the year. 
That's how they feel. Anything less than an ACC title and a college football playoff berth is unacceptable in Tallahassee. I don't think Mike Norvell would ever tell you that, but I promise you, internally, those have to be goals for them. And quite frankly, they've earned the right now for those to be goals for them. It's one thing to just sort of shoot for the stars and talk about making a college football playoff and playing for a national title when you're missing bowl games. It's a whole other conversation when you've got the number one returning production in the country and you won a whole lot of ball games the year before and you got your quarterback back. Like, that's a different conversation. So for Florida State, this is the year. Now, the last team we're going to talk about here is a team that always has pressure on them by nature of the logo, by nature of the location. It's Texas Longhorns. Everything's bigger in Texas. I lived in the state of Texas for a period of time, and I will tell you this, they love their football. High school, peewee, college, professional, doesn't matter. They love their football. And a large portion of that state loves their Longhorns. And for Texas now, same thing I was saying with Florida State, they've built to this. For Steve Sarkeesian, it's year three. Quinn Ewers, second year in the saddle, going to be the starting quarterback. There's no more excuses for Texas. And Texas fans have had excuses as much as they've probably hated to say them. They've had excuses built in with, yeah, but the culture isn't where it needs to be. Quinn Ewers, yeah, super talented, but guys, he's supposed to be a freshman. He graduated high school early. Like, he's still figuring it out. Give him time. There's no more of that on the table for Texas. On top of that, look at the weapons you have on this offense. Xavier Worthy is that dude. But then you got Isaiah Nayor. You got A.D. Mitchell via the transfer portal. You're going to have a stable of running backs. C.J. Baxter, I think, the five-star freshman, is going to be a guy for you, along with Keelan Robinson. Like, you go down the line here, and for Texas, there's no more excuses. Everything is there to win. And the Big 12, I've said it before, it is 1 million percent wide open. I think Oklahoma is going to be really good. Kansas State, they bring a lot back. At least they bring their quarterback back with Will Howard. Like TCU, who knows what they're going to be under Sonny Dykes in his second year. But there's no like team you point at and say, yeah, you're going to have to really take the crown from them. There's no team like that right now in the Big 12. It's all very much so for the taking. And I've said it before, I don't think for Texas it needs to be a college football playoff year. I think they need to at least make the Big 12 title. But I also know this, I'm in the minority when it comes to Texas fans. Like, Texas fans do not feel the same way that I feel. They feel like it has to be a Big 12 title, and they feel like they have to make the college football playoff. And you know what? They've earned the right to believe that. They've earned the right now, in terms of the roster, that is, to believe that that's something that they can attain and they can shoot for in 2023. Here's the other kind of side quest that we got to talk about with Texas. Yeah, they'll play for the Big 12 this year. You know, that's going to be the goal for them is win a conference title and, and play for the Big 12 title and all that. But they go to the SEC next year. And this year is paramount for trajectory for Texas. Because think about it this way. And, I, and Texas fans, you hate when I say this. we got a lot of people that are new to this show, so i got to kind of lay this out there for y'all. If Texas were to win seven games, if Texas were to win eight games, you say, okay, that's great, but... Where is this thing going? That's awesome that you're, you, know, you won seven games. I'm all for that. We played for a bowl game. That's cool. But where is where's this thing going? If I'm a recruit, am I signing up for the trajectory of that Texas team? Because, listen, I love the Big 12. I've lived a large portion of my life in Big 12 country. But the SEC now, it's a different beast. I mean, Kirk Herbstreit, when he came on this very show, he was like, yeah, listen, I mean, they go play with the big boys in 2024 when he was talking about Oklahoma and Texas making that jump to the SEC. Like the SEC, in terms of the competition, it's going to be brutal. It will. It will be more difficult week in and week out than the Big 12. Just a reality. So for Texas, if you're not going to achieve what you're capable of in the Big 12 this year and it gets harder in 2024 and I'm a recruit, I may not have the confidence to sign up for that. Now, far be it for me to say Texas won't recruit well. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying for the trajectory, if you're going to go ahead and win the Big 12 and then go to the SEC after, let's say, winning the Big 12 and making a college football playoff, well, then that conversation changes. Then you say, okay, yeah, I want to be a part of that. So this is a big year for the trajectory of the program and to pitch that to recruits in the future. So to give you a recap here, for Michigan, for USC, for Florida State, for Texas, this is the year. I can't wait to watch it. 
man, how about it? What if all four of those teams make the college football playoff? What if that's our field? That would require the SEC getting left out, so I'd be a little bit surprised. But, hey, I'm just saying, if that ends up being the field, we'll come back to this segment and we'll, uh, we'll all celebrate it together. Appreciate everybody tuned in live. I got to make a quick disclaimer to everyone that is new to this show because we've had a lot of y'all join the program here over the last couple of weeks as we get closer and closer to college football season. Maybe we've popped up in your suggested feed. Maybe you found us on podcast and said, hmm, I want to go watch the YouTube version of this. We're glad you're here to just kind of broadly lay out what we are, what this is. I say we on purpose because this is our show, okay? This is a thing where there is a lot of college football content out there, and I don't know there's quite as much that is keeping you and I in mind. When I say you and I, I mean the fan. I mean people that wake up on Saturday morning, they watch college game day or big noon kickoff, and they watch it, you know, college football all the way until 2 a.m. until Pac-12 after dark finishes up. Like this is our sport and this is a show where we try and embody that, encapsulate that, and really just talk about the things that you and I want to talk about. So if you're new here, welcome. If you haven't yet subscribed, we'd love to have you part of this operation. And we do content every single day. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later in the show in terms of our, our content pattern. But we're live on Tuesdays, live on Thursdays, talking ball. Rain or shine, 365, we're talking ball every Tuesday and Thursday. And we talk ball on this channel every single day. All right? So with that out of the way, we're glad to have you here. Let's keep this party rolling. And let's talk about a, a, uh, a little bit of a rumbling that's gone around our college football ecosystem here. Really ever since the confetti dropped in Los Angeles. And Nick Brake and I were there. It was a scene and a half. Like it was pandemonium on that field as Georgia celebrated their second national title in two years. And a lot of people started thinking, man, is anybody going to beat Georgia? They were already thinking that going into 2023. Can anybody beat Georgia? Now, I want to make this very clear. This is not a prediction segment. Like, I'm not predicting Georgia's to do anything in this very segment. We'll definitely predict them as we get further and further into this uh, fall, or closer to the fall, rather. But we had a segment on the On3 Roundtable, which is a separate YouTube channel where we talk to some of the best in the industry and their respective markets and we had rusty mansell on who is co-owner of dogs hq or georgia on three site and i just asked him man i was like listen georgia their roster is so stacked yes you lose stetson bennett but you bring in carson beck you bring back 70 percent of the production on defense that was really good last year like how do you beat georgia rusty and he kind of laid out this formula for me he's like when you watched ohio state last year it really felt like they had them on the ropes I mean, Kirby Smart, after that game, if you're reading between the lines there, said that Georgia played poorly enough to lose that game in the semifinal. And a big part of what Ohio State did was winning one-on-ones. And Rusty essentially just laid it out. He's like, if you want to beat Georgia, you got to make it a game where you win those one-on-one battles on the outside. Your big dog wide receiver better play like that big dog wide receiver and go win. And so if that's the formula, there's a little more than what meets the eye, but I think what Rusty said is on the money. If you want to beat Georgia, you got to win outside. you got to win over the top. Because if you play in the trenches with Georgia, I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm saying I haven't seen it done consistently and effectively to the level at which it gives me a ton of confidence for anybody wanting to play in the trenches against Georgia. So if you are going to win one-on-one, how do you make that happen? One, you got to have some kind of success in the run game. Now, you don't live in the trenches. You don't make it a game where you play three yards in a cloud of dust against Georgia because that's just beating your head against the wall, and eventually Georgia's going to figure that out. But you do it enough to where you earn the right to be one-on-one on the outside, meaning those safeties, they can't just sit back and play over the top and be safety help for the deep pass if you're able to get something on the ground, if you're able to create something with the power game or inside zone game, whatever it is, just enough to keep them honest. Just enough to keep them honest. That's one piece of this. The other way to do it is you scheme it up. Now, Tennessee did this, and Georgia dared them to do it, quite frankly. I mean, Georgia just played man coverage and said, we like our guys better than your guys. But that's the other thing you can do. In modern college football, without getting too in the weeds, the hashes are set up to where you can line somebody way the heck out near the sideline, and just by nature of what humans are capable of doing, you can't cover all 53.3 yards of width. So you have one guy all the way out there 
with not as much space to work with when it comes to the sideline, but he's got the rest of the field to try and win. So you got to win one-on-one. Going back to that winning one-on-one, you can kind of scheme it up to a degree. And you got to make your shot when it's open. If you win your one-on-one, you got to make sure you capitalize on it. But that's another way that you can try and get this done against Georgia. So who could it be? That's, that's really the, the whole question we got to ask here. Who could it be if you're going to try and beat the Georgia Bulldogs? we got to look at the regular season schedule. We'll talk more about you know some playoff possibilities. i got one playoff possibility that I think is interesting. But we just got to look at the regular season schedule here. And let's start with week three. It's South Carolina and... I mean, they go to Athens, which isn't ideal, but they go to South, or excuse me, South Carolina comes to Athens, and that's one team that I think is very fascinating because of what we just talked about. Having an alpha dog wide receiver, Juice Wells, he was that guy at the end of the year, man. Him and Spencer Rattler were synced up, and he was putting up road to glory numbers. Against Tennessee, I think he had like close to 200 yards receiving. He had two touchdowns against Clemson. Like They were just playing upset like it was their job with South Carolina. Now, roster-wise, I don't think South Carolina matches up well with Georgia. It's not saying much. Not many places do across the country. But there's a couple things to look into now. Does Juice Wells just play to his potential and and have a a day like he had against Tennessee and and win one-on-one, and maybe he's just your equalizer. Maybe he's your edge for you that day. Also, it's the first SEC game. This is the first game of real competition that Georgia's going to see. Now, I don't love that for for South Carolina because typically Georgia, especially early in the year, they're not a team that you're really going to see fall asleep at the wheel. I'm pretty sure Kirby Smart has just eliminated complacency, not just within his building in Athens, but just like the entire city of Athens. I just think he just radiates intentionality and we're going to be detail-oriented and we're not going to be complacent. Like, that's one thing. The other thing that concerns me a little bit about South Carolina in this game is just what I said to preface this segment. You got to run the ball well enough to where you keep those safeties honest. Now, South Carolina last year, when they lost this game, their leading rusher had 33 yards. Doesn't inspire a ton of confidence if you're playing Georgia. You you can't be one-dimensional against Georgia other side of this is it would require Spencer Rattler to play mistake-free football. I don't know if he's able to do that against a defense like Georgia. So not predicting this, but if you were to look at a matchup early in the year where you say, okay, if it is about one-on-one, then it is about having that alpha dog wide receiver. Juice Wells has shown he can be that guy for you if you're South Carolina. So keep an eye on that one. South Carolina, I think, is one team. If you were looking for potential bugaboos for Georgia, I think that's the one. So make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you're locked in right here. We talk ball every single day. Glad to have you a part of it. We'll move right along here. Another team we got to look at here, Kentucky. Kentucky goes to Athens. Again, not your favorite situation. October 7th, we're sticking with the same theme here. If it is about wide receiver play, if that is the one edge that you think you can maybe have over Georgia, Kentucky Got a three-headed monster at wide receiver. Barry and Brown, all everything freshman last year. Dane Key, another dog freshman for them. Some people in in Kentucky believe that Dane Key was actually the best receiver for for Kentucky last year. Tavian Robinson, dynamic in the slot. Like They got some pieces now, and not just one piece, which is crucial, to where if Georgia wants to play Kentucky straight up, you don't need just one alpha wide receiver to get open. You got three options. You got three guys that if they get open, you can get them the football. Maybe good things can happen for you. The other side of this, and this is maybe a little bit more of a take that I'm in the the minority on, but Will Levis, probably one of the most talented arms in college football last year. But even so, man, you know what he didn't do well was take care of the football. Last two years for Will Levis, double-digit interceptions. Now enter into the fray via the transfer portal, Devin Leary from NC State. Devin Leary has never thrown double-digit interceptions in a season ever in college. So Devin Leary, still a very capable, talented quarterback. If he takes care of the football, and maybe one of these guys, or maybe it's by committee between these three receivers, Robinson, Brown, and Key, if one of them has a great day, that could be the edge for Kentucky. That could be the way that maybe you catch Georgia sleeping October 7th after they play Auburn, they go to Jordan Hare. Maybe, just maybe for Kentucky, that's your edge in that ballgame. Last thing I'll say about Kentucky, remember last year, 
it felt like Georgia just rolled through the regular season. Well, actually, Kentucky gave them a pretty good ball game. It was ugly. It was at Kentucky. I think it was rainy. Final score was 16-6. to six. As much as you want to say about Kentucky last year and what they didn't do relative to expectations going into the year, only lost to Georgia by 10 points. We're not into moral victories, but I think that's one thing to watch for. Now, the problem is when you play Georgia, I just think this offense is going to continue to be dynamic. Like, I think Mike Bobo and Carson Beck, I don't think they'll miss a beat from where Bennett and Munkin left off. So you got to score with Georgia. Unfortunately, I don't think you'll hold them to 16 points this coming season. But there is a way. There is a path, I believe, for Kentucky to potentially get it done. So keep an eye on Kentucky. Now, the last one on the regular season is one that all of the good folks in Athens have circled, and a lot of people in the volunteer state have it circled as well. Because the second to last week of the season, the dogs go to Neyland Stadium. The place will be rocking, especially if Tennessee is able to trend the way that a lot of people believe they could trend up to that point. It could be a game that decides that side of the SEC. Last year, Jalen Hyatt and Hennon Hooker had a couple of shots in this game that they almost connected on, but almost just means they didn't connect on them. And a lot of Tennessee fans will tell you, if they connect on just one of those, I think it was like two or three they took deep to Jalen Hyatt, they didn't hit on. If they connect on one of those, it might change the ball game, and it might put Georgia a little bit on their heels early. Now, of course, it was in Athens. Place was rocking. They go to Neyland this year. And Neyland, not an easy place to play. So for Georgia, the same thing is, is true of what happened last year has to happen this year. you got to win one-on-one on the outside. And Tennessee, even though you lose Jalen Hyde, even though you lose Cedric Tillman, I'm still very high on their receiving core. Brew McCoy is going to be physical with you. Squirrel White, 23 miles per hour on the catapult. Translation, dude is fast. Speeding in a school zone. Dante Thornton. Transfer from Oregon, I think, is going to just have an elite season for Tennessee. I would not be surprised at all if Dante Thornton has the best season of the entire Tennessee wide receiving core. I'll just say it right now. He may lead the team in receiving. Unique blend of, of speed and size, so he's tough to match up with. Also, for Georgia now, I'm not down on any of their secondary, but I will say Keely Ringo did a really good job one-on-one last year in this game who is it this year is it malachi starks probably but i'm just saying keep an eye on that for for georgia and for tennessee the one-on-one battle tennessee's going to spread you out they're going to have a chance to to take some of those shots it's going to require georgia to be disciplined and that's georgia's middle name but still keep an eye on that one of all these games i like this one the best because it's at neyland it's not going to athens now if you're a georgia fan Maybe you're an Ole Miss fan. If you're watching this program, you're saying, well, they still got to play Ole Miss. J.D., you just forget about Coach Kiffin. Didn't forget about Coach Kiffin, but the way that they play, I think it would require a superhuman effort in the trenches by Ole Miss. Like last year, they ran the ball 60% of the time. I love Quinn Sean Judkins. Heck, I'm even higher on Jackson Dart than the average Bear is, but even with that being said, I don't love Ole Miss's chances having to play in the box and be in a a wrestling match against Georgia, just big on big. I don't like anyone big on big against Georgia. You got to win on the outside if you want to beat Georgia. So for that reason, Ole Miss did not make this list. One more team we got to talk about here because you assume at this point in the year for Trust in Vegas that Georgia finds himself back in the college football playoff. For the sake of this conversation, we're going to make that assumption. Who could beat Georgia? Well, who had Georgia on the ropes last year in the game of the year? None other than the Ohio State Buckeyes. And if Marvin Harrison Jr. stays in that game, there's a lot of folks in Columbus that believe Ohio State may have played for and then won a national title. Marvin Harrison Jr. and company, they think there's unfinished business. And if you were to go down to the the football offices at Ohio State, you would go to the Woody Hayes Athletic Center and say, hey, you make the college football playoff, who do you want to play? Pick any team. I think Ohio State would, not because of a matchup standpoint, but because of a pride and we got to get what we believe is ours back and we want to finish the deal, I believe they would say, you know what, we probably wouldn't want to play until the natty, but we want to play Georgia. We want to have a chance to go back at the best in the country, 
and try and exploit that matchup that we had. Because Marvin Harrison Jr. was cooking like Walter White in that game before he got injured and went out of the game. I mean, he was the difference maker. And Marvin Harrison Jr. is a one-of-one, one, so I don't want to just like paint that to be the formula to beat Georgia completely because Marvin Harrison Jr., there's nobody else like him in the country. But like, you hear what I'm saying here. Marvin Harrison Jr., if he's on his game, if he's able to win one-on-one -on -one and just have his kind of game that he wants to have against Georgia, like that could be the difference maker. That was the difference maker last year. Obviously, he goes out of the game, and one thing led to another, and Georgia came storming back. But like, still, you hear what I'm saying. Marvin Harrison Jr. could be that kryptonite for the defense. Now, here's my concern. Who'd you have throwing the ball to Marvin Harrison Jr. last year? <laughs> C.J. Stroud, second overall pick in the NFL draft. So a lot would have to fall on, you would imagine, Kyle McCord shoulders, shoulders uh, or Devin Brown shoulders, I guess, whoever ends up starting there. You also got to get past Michigan. But I'm just saying, if there's one person that I believe Georgia wouldn't want to play, I think it's Marvin Harrison Jr. So... South Carolina, Kentucky, Tennessee in the regular season, I think have the best shot to try and dethrone Georgia. Ohio State in the playoff, because of having Marvin Harrison Jr., you got to feel a little bit confident in your chances to get that done. So who's going to beat Georgia? I don't know. But I think those teams have the best chances. All right, I appreciate everybody tuned in live here. You know what? If everybody liked the video that's tuned in live right now, that little thumbs up button under the screen, we'd have over 100 likes. We got a streak going right now, I believe, of four consecutive shows of over 100 likes. You don't mind hitting the thumbs up button for us? It's completely free. Would help us help you. And it would help the algorithm. So thank you for that. Let's bully YouTube. All right. Really quick note I want to make for a lot of y'all that are new. A lot of y'all also that are new have found us by way of podcast, which we're so glad you're here. I say this a lot. If you're on podcast, it means you are in the trenches with us. Like, hey, I can't make the live show, but I'm on podcast because I got to be here for my guys. So we thank you for that. But if you're on podcast, I just want to make sure that you know we have this full-length podcast come out every Tuesday, every Thursday because Nick Brake just absolutely cooks it up. But the other side of this is we do content every single day. Like, we do one-off videos. So, for example, Mike Florio from Pro Football Talk kind of was talking crazy on Nick Saban. Nick Brake and I talked about it before we went, went in here on Monday, and we did a, a short video on that very topic. Now, we're going to talk about it right now on this live show, but I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page here. This live show happens twice a week. And we put that on podcast. But if you're only listening on podcast, you're missing other content that we're putting on the YouTube page. So I'll just leave that there. If you're on podcast, go jump over to YouTube, make sure you're subscribed, and we'll keep rolling. So thank you in advance for that. We just shot up to 60 likes. Y'all are elite. Again, if, I'll just, I'll just say, say one more time. If everyone who's watching right now live could like the video, we'll be past 100. And we'll keep the streak alive. All right, let's, let's, let's not let the streak die with that. Okay, so thank you in advance for that, and we're going to keep on rolling. All right, let's play a little bit of Mythbusters here. We did a video on it yesterday, like I just mentioned, but I think we need to take a second bite out of this apple. Mike Florio from Pro Football Talk, who I have tremendous respect for, has an article out there essentially saying that Nick Saban is anti-NIL because it hurts his best interests. And you all remember that show. I think it was on Discovery, Nick, now that I'm thinking about it a little bit more clearly. It's a show on Discovery Channel called Myth, Myth, Mythbusters. And it's these, this group of guys that essentially put myths to the test to really see if they are legitimate. Like, I guess some of the old myths, Nick, if I can remember, was like, if you punched a shark in the nose, it wouldn't bite you. Like, you could actually fight off a shark. That was one myth that... They had a machine, and they busted that myth. Anyway, we're going to keep rolling here. There's some myths that need to be busted when it comes to Nick Saban, and the first myth we need to address is that Nick Saban is going to Washington, D.C., among other, along with others, to meet with lawmakers to push back on NIL because it hurts what he wants to do, because it's against Nick Saban's best interests to help his football team to recruit better and to, to kind of keep his edge in college football. That's the myth right now. Now, here's what I would say is actually happening. In busting that myth, here's the best scenario I could explain. If I drive a fast car, like for just this conversation, let's say I somehow drive a Ferrari. Some pretty good speed, right? And then lawmakers out of nowhere say, you know what? 
you don't need a governor on an engine anymore, and you don't need a speed limit anymore. And I'm over there saying, whoa, 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 are we sure we want to do that? Are we sure that's in the best interest of everybody? And I go talk to lawmakers and say, hey, this is a bad idea. Trust me. But then everybody else that drives a different car says, you know what? You just don't want us going fast like you. You don't want us to be able to get to where we want to go because you want to have the only fast car. That's not what's happening. That's not the case. Yeah, everyone's driving the speed limit because it's safe, because it helps us all. Regulation is a good thing. When you say everyone go as fast as you want, no rules, do what you want, that's not in the best interest of everybody involved here. I think that's what Nick Saban is doing. He's saying, listen, yeah, I got a fast car. Yeah, I got a program in Alabama that just churns out New Year's Six Bowls and has previously churned out national titles. Like, yeah, he's recruited well in modern college football. But him saying we need regulation is not him saying, woe is me, you're hurting my chances. Nick Saban is going to do what Nick Saban does, and we'll talk about that in a second. But this is not Nick Saban crying for help. He is saying, listen, college football is going to go on with or without me here at some point in time. I don't want to leave it in a place where I feel like it's headed in the wrong direction. Because NIL is not meant to be a recruiting tool. I talked to someone who used to be in the college world previously, just transitioned to the NFL world. We talked about NIL, and he's like, listen, man, it's not what it was for. It's supposed to be for college athletes to capitalize on their name, image, and likeness and get themselves something from their value. Not for high school kids to have a bag dropped on them and try and pick their school. More on that in a second. Make sure you're subscribed. Follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Instagram, at JD Pacquel. Appreciate you in advance for that. Like the video. Let's get to over 100 likes, and we'll keep this party rolling. Okay, so thank you for that. So that's the first myth that had to be busted. Now, in that same vein, the other myth that deserves to be busted is that now recruiting is going to be tougher for Nick Saban. Too bad for Nick Saban. You recruited well, haha, <laughs> not anymore. NIL, brother. It's too bad now. Now the playing field is level and you are in trouble. Okay? Think what you want to think. That's the myth. If you want to see it busted, look at the recruiting rankings. In 2023, number one class. Some people are saying the best class he's ever signed what some people are saying. Look at 2024. It's got a top three class in the on three industry rankings. I would feel pretty confident betting he will be somewhere within that top three when it comes to National Signing Day in December and the second National Signing Day in February. Nick Saban's not hurting when it comes to recruiting. Nick Saban's going to get top players because Alabama develops. Alabama puts guys in the NFL. And oh, by the way, they win a lot of games too. So Alabama's going to be just fine as long as Nick Saban's there. The other piece of that, which is based in a fallacy, is that kids are picking schools solely based on NIL. I don't think that's the world we're living in right now. Does it play a factor? Yeah, I think it plays a factor. But the large majority of recruits that we talked to at last week's On3 NIL Elite Series were saying, listen, I want to go that's going to help me in the long term. It's going to help me get to the NFL. You know who helps you get to the NFL? We look at the draft picks, Alabama. That's the school that helps you get drafted. And so NIL is not going to be a thing that hurts Alabama. That's the last myth I want to get to here. Alabama is using NIL as a tool. NIL doesn't hurt Alabama. You know who NIL hurts? Is the group of five schools. The schools that are having players perform and maybe aren't getting the money that they would like to get. And they say, hmm, I got a lot of talent. Maybe I'll jump in that portal. Or maybe somebody hits them up and says, hey, why don't you jump in the portal? And then they end up at a bigger school. So who's for the worse here? Let's say USF is for the worse here because they just lost that big-time wide receiver that was all conference, and now he's going somewhere else. This is purely hypothetical. I don't have a situation in mind here that I'm playing out. So if it matches up with anything that you're thinking about right now, Really hypothetical. I want to make sure that's out there. NIL doesn't hurt Alabama. NIL is only going to help Alabama in the long term. But when it comes to who's being hurt, like I said, it's the, the group of five schools, the have-nots. They're going to lose talent. They're going to lose top players. Alabama, when it comes to the NIL space, they're going to be able to be competitive if a guy does jump in the portal. If a top player does jump in the portal and decides to visit Alabama, Alabama's going to be able to say, listen, do we have the the top NIL budget in the country? I don't know that for a fact. I don't think Alabama uses NIL as their calling card, but they're going to be competitive enough, I believe, along with the rest of the things they have at Alabama, like development, resources. Oh, by the way, the greatest coach of all time. 
then they're going to be, you know, in good position or at least in better position to land that kid from the portal. It's not hurting Alabama. Nick Saban is seeing this and seeing how it's going to hurt the other schools and saying, listen, are we sure we want to do this? I'm going to be fine. No skin off my back if I'm Nick Saban, but are we sure we want to do this? That's what I think is happening right now. So for Nick Saban, this is not a thing that he is running from. This is something he's running towards and saying, I don't think this is best. Could it impact him long term? Maybe. Remains to be seen. But I don't think this is something he's running towards and saying, hey, it's going to hurt me. I think he's saying, hey, it's going to hurt our sport. Let's put some regulation on this. Regulation, for the most part, is a good thing nine times out of ten. I'll tell you what, man. Nick Brake and I, we were in here yesterday. We got into it a little bit. We talked We talked about a little pro football talk with Mike Florio and that article. Nick, Nick Brake now, big pro football talk consumer. So I'm excited to talk about that when he gets on here in just a few minutes. Get in your thoughts, questions, concerns to Nick Brake, the keeper of the queue here. We're going to talk about that in just a few short minutes. Before we get to that, though, like the video. We're about 10 likes away from keeping that streak alive. So if you could hit that thumbs up button underneath, that'd be phenomenal. That'd be all we ask from you. That, and please subscribe to the show. All right. Now, there was a tweet that went out, I believe it was yesterday, from the Tennessee football account. And it was a highlight tape of Joe Milton. And within that highlight tape, within that hype video, they featured a segment from the hard count. And I just want to say this. Anytime that happens, it's exciting because the show gets you know put somewhere in the college football landscape and in the media and the Twitter sphere. And that's awesome. And we like to talk about it and we'll, we'll re retweet it. But I want to make sure I say this on the show. Anytime the hard count is featured in any hype video, that is a program win. What I mean by that is that is as much a success for us here on, on this side of the camera as much as it is a win for y'all that are watching it. Because I'll tell you this, those creative departments, they're not finding any of our content if y'all aren't watching it, sharing it, subscribing, liking it. Like, it's not happening without all of us. And so I just want to make sure that was out there. Anytime we see that, we're going to go ahead and quote tweet it for you. And I'm just going to say this, program win. Okay, program win, because that's what it is. All of us involved here make up the program, and all of us here win whenever something like that happens, such as the hard count being put in a hype video. So from me to y'all, thank you. And let's keep getting after it, all right? Let's keep getting after it. Less than 100 days until college football season, we're going to keep getting wins. Roll party roll. All right. A team that has been winning a lot on the recruiting trail or got a big one on the recruiting trail yesterday as none other then Dabo Sweeney and the Clemson Tigers, they landed a commitment from five-star linebacker Sammy Brown. The best mullet in the 2024 cycle is off the board. He's heading to Clemson, South Carolina. This put Clemson at number 11. There was a decommitment elsewhere in the top 10 that pushed Clemson up a spot into the top 10. So don't look now, folks. It's only June. we got a long way to go till signing day, but Clemson Tigers chilling with the top 10 class right now. This is significant because last year in 2023, they had the number 11 class. The year before, they had the number 14 class. So Clemson right now is starting to have some momentum on the recruiting trail. They're trending in the right way for some other guys. We'll talk about that in a second. But Clemson being able to have a top 10 class and being able to recruit well is enormously important. And we all understand why, because Clemson, what do they not do? historically they don't go to the portal there's been a couple of one-offs been a couple of guys that they are familiar with that they've gone and you know landed out of the transfer portal but for the most part rule of thumb for Dabo Sweeney he don't do it so whoever you land on national signing day whoever puts pen to paper and wants to come to Clemson South Carolina that's your roster that's how you make your hay that is your team and in college football talent is the number one ingredient that you need it doesn't guarantee wins but it definitely means you can't win without talent right now, at least in college football. And some people will say, well, Cincinnati made the college football playoff. TCU made the national title. JD talent isn't everything. I, I hear what you're saying, but I would also say, look at those rosters. A lot of those teams, or excuse me, both those teams had a lot of guys that got drafted. Translation, there was a lot of talent on both those teams. So for Clemson to have a top 10 class and to be a talented roster and to recruit the way they're recruiting, that is how they're going to build it going forward. Here's the other thing I'll say. Clemson, not going to the portal, recruiting the way that they recruit, 
It's unconventional. And unconventional is okay, but it's only okay as long as your unconventional is better than everybody else's conventional. I say it a lot. I'm going to say it again. The comp for me for Clemson is Chick-fil-A. Like it just is. Chick-fil-A, what do they do? Not open on Sundays and they only serve chicken. That's unconventional. But you know what? I would venture to say the large majority of the population will pick Chick-fil-A over Burger King. No shade on Burger King, but Chick-fil-A does their unconventional better than Burger King's conventional. And so for Clemson, if you want to be unconventional, if you want to not use the portal where you better do your unconventional, you better recruit at the elite level to compete for what you expect to compete to because the standard is still there. The standard is still win the ACC, make the college football playoff, compete for national titles. The standard for Chick-fil-A, have the best fast food that's out there. The standard is the standard. When you start to drop off in your unconventional way of doing things, then things start to get a little bit less comfortable for everybody involved. But Landon Sammy Brown and Clemson being in the top 10 right now, it's a very big deal. Talk more about that in a second. Make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you're following me on Twitter and on Instagram, at JD Paquel. Like the video. It's all I'm asking. So thank you in advance for that. So if you're a Clemson fan, this is a little bit extra encouraging for you. Because you have had to listen and maybe even started to believe a little bit. It's okay if you did. There's no judgment here. If you believed it a little bit, that's fine. That Dabo Sweeney and modern college football are starting to pass each other. Maybe the game is starting to evolve a little bit more and, and pass Dabo Sweeney by. And seeing him being in the top 10 right now is encouraging because since 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, all those recruiting classes, they were all in the top 10. That was when Clemson was humming right along. And so to see Dabo land a five-star in the state of Georgia, where the University of Georgia is, that's back-to-back -back national champs, by the way, and to see them be in the top 10 right now, you can't help but feel just a little bit. If you're Dabo Sweeney or if you're a Clemson fan, you're like, man, Dabo still got it. Dabo still got it. Don't look now, but here come the Tigers. Because going back to what I just said, that's what you need to be able to compete in modern college football. You got to have the talent level. If you don't have it from the portal, got to go get it from the high school level. Seeing Dabo Sweeney do that, I think, is encouraging. Also, they're trending in the right way for a lot of other top prospects. A couple of receivers on the board in Texas and SEC country that Clemson likes where they stand right now. Had a big official visit weekend this past weekend. Like, I don't think Clemson's done. Sammy Brown tweeted it out. This is just the beginning for us. Usually when a recruit says something like that and puts it out on Twitter, I think they know something or at least have a strong inkling of something. Keep an eye on Clemson. They're at number 10 right now, but I think they're going to make some moves this summer when it comes to those on three industry recruiting rankings. So you're excited about that if you're Clemson because it feels like you're getting back to old Clemson, back to old Dabo, back to that old kind of roster talent level you used to have when you were showing up to the college football playoff every single year like it was your job. Now, I will say this. For Clemson, this is a great place to start, but it's June. It's June, and the real signing day is in December, so you need to keep building this thing. And you got to build it, in my opinion, at the positions that matter with the big human beings, the defensive line and the offensive line, the trenches, and you got to add some versatility skill set wise at wide receiver. Because listen, big human beings, we were on the field pregame for TCU and Georgia, the national title game. We saw warm ups from the sideline. TCU had some big human beings. Georgia's big human beings just looked like they were developed in a lab. And that's the national title game. I understand that Clemson's going to play some other competition before they get to a point like that. But, like, big people still win in this game. It's still a big person's game. All right? So you got to have the big human beings at Clemson to play for what you want to play for. The other part of that, like I just said, the wide receiver position, I think Clemson right now has got a lot of guys that can go get that 50-50 ball for you. A lot of guys that can go win in the red zone and go take it off the top shelf where the kids can't get it. Like, I love that. I think you need a lot of that. But you got to have a little bit of lightning to that thunder. Antonio Williams, for my money at least, is one of the only guys that I see on that roster that's able to stretch the field how you need to stretch the field, be able to pop the top of the defense and keep that safety honest. And when you go play action, have somebody that can run deep for you. 
he's the only guy that I know for a fact, at least have seen with my own two eyes in a game, do that for Clemson. Now, a lot of y'all that are Clemson faithful have gotten the comment section and, and got at me and said, hey, we got this guy, this guy, this guy, and I'm all for that. I, I don't disagree. You may have guys on your roster right now that can do that, but I think you need to continue to recruit some versatility at the skill position, all right? I don't think they don't have it. I'm just saying I've only seen one guy so far, and you got to be able to stretch the field and be, ver uh, be versatile, get vertical, rather, in the pass game for Kate Clubbing and company and for Chris Vizina when his time comes. So I want to end this segment right here with a prediction. I think Clemson is going to keep surging. And the reason why I think that is the NIL era started, and that was the buzz in recruiting, right? That was what everybody was talking about. Whether it was actually the case or not, I don't know, but you saw some schools be known for what they did in the NIL space and really be in good position, really be pretty high in those recruiting rankings. Now, what we know about Clemson is that isn't necessarily the game that they have played historically. doesn't seem like that's a, a space they have really pushed too hard in. But I think we're starting to see, by nature of the kids that we talked to this past weekend, or past week, rather, at the On3 NIL Elite Series, I think we're starting to see a little bit more of a development in that space, where we see NIL is important, but in terms of priorities and the money that's actually being given to recruits, maybe it's a little bit lower on the totem pole of priorities than maybe it was at first made out to be. And when that happens, when you go back to things that are going to matter to kids, which is development, culture, heck, I think winning somewhere in there as well, to be real with you, because that means exposure. I think Clemson checks a lot of those boxes. And I think for Coach Sweeney and company, now Clemson is going to be able to recruit a little bit more similar to how they were recruiting in the pre-NIL era. So NIL has got to be a factor to some degree, but I think the way that it's trending right now and the understanding these kids are gaining as we get more and more education in the NIL space for all of us, I think it's going to benefit Clemson. So keep an eye on that. But landing a five-star linebacker from the state of Georgia, not too far from Kirby Smart and company for Dabo Sweeney. That's a big win. I'm telling you, Clemson and Dabo, watch out now. Watch out. Appreciate everybody tuned in live. Look at us, man. Man, I say look at us. Look at y'all. Over 100 likes. We still got one more segment to go, man. That fires me up. We appreciate y'all. Gosh, dang it. I love that, man. Never had a doubt. Never had a doubt. Appreciate everybody tuned in live. Like the video just for the heck of it so we can bully YouTube a little bit. Get in the live chat. Let Nick break know your questions, comments, concerns. We're about to talk about that in just a second here. Before we get to that, though, I want to... Give a little quick story from the On3 NIL Elite Series. Because a lot of y'all that are tuned in right now, y'all are the, the guys that have been in the trenches with us. I say the guys. Maybe the girls as well that have been in the trenches with us. The program people that are in the trenches with us on this show. And if you were tuned out in the first couple of segments, that's fine. We have no issues with you. But y'all that are tuned in right now, you know, you're the real ones. So I want to tell a quick story from last week that I think is just hilarious. We sat down with Kirk Herbstreet. And it was phenomenal. I mean, our team being able to put a set together in the hallway of a ballroom at a hotel in downtown Nashville, like can't say enough great things about Nick Brake and Trey Entity making that happen. But I want to give a little bit of a story to the lead up of that. So we were told, hey, probably talking to Kirk Herbstreet somewhere in the three o'clock window. He's going to speak to everybody there and then there'll be a meet and greet and then we'll likely have a chance to talk to him. So we're like, OK, great. Well, 130, 145 rolls around, and it's like, hey, it's go time. And immediately, there was a little bit of a sense of like, oh, okay, we got to roll. And at this point in time, don't have a set ready, don't have lights ready, don't have a table, don't have chairs, and everybody, I'm talking everybody involved with this, sprung into action like the Avengers. It was so cool. I mean, we, rent, we, we grabbed a table from where the kids were checking in at. It wasn't our table. Didn't matter. Kirk Herbstreet's coming. Grab it, put it down. Chairs, don't have chairs. Grab them off of a stack, put them down. Josh Newberg's testing the mics. Like, it, it was just a full-on, no huddle, no mercy, Chip Kelly, Josh Heupel, Jeff Levy kind of offense operation to get it done. And again, I can't say enough good things about Nick Brick and Trey Entity making that happen. But it was, uh, it was not something that was just, you know, hey, we're on the one-yard line, let's punch it in. It was, all right, we got to go here. We got to go. Let's make it happen. And of course, our team did. 
and very grateful for how it came together and very, very grateful for the greatest of all time, Kirk Herbstreit, sitting down with us and talking some ball. So before we get to y'all's questions, one more thing I want to talk about. There is a Netflix documentary coming out August 23rd or so we've heard about Urban Meyer and Tim Tebow's Florida Gators. It's going to be titled Swamp Kings. The reason that we know this is Brandon Seiler was a linebacker on that team. He screenshotted an email that he supposedly got from Netflix saying, hey, go ahead and, and kind of get some promotion going for this documentary. We're going to send you a sweatshirt. Anyway, it, it essentially broke the internet. Like it, it was all that I could think about for the duration of the weekend when I found out that was going to happen. Because we've been clamoring for this for a while. Like People have tweeted about this for a long time. Man, I wonder if we could one day get a documentary about that story. Now, there is a thread on Gators Online from Zach Alberverdi talking about this very thing. So if you want inf more information, go get a membership at Gators Online. They're going to keep you in the know. But I just wanted to kind of have a conversation here about things that I hope we see in this documentary. I mean, great documentaries, what do they capture? They capture the inside stuff, right? And the locker rooms, just in general, locker rooms, I believe, are a lot like national parks in the sense that they are one of the last remaining places where camera crews are yet to go. Same thing with, with national parks. Like, you don't go and develop a mall in a national park. Why? Because it's, it's, you know, it's sacred. You don't, you don't go there. Same thing with locker rooms. You don't go in there. Meaning, everything that happened in that locker room for Florida, all we have to go off of are stories. And it sounds like we got Urban Meyer on the documentary. It sounds like we got Tebow on the documentary. I'm curious to see who else we got on the documentary. But I'm just curious to hear, what was that locker room like, man? Because you had Tebow, you had the Pouncey Twins, you had Aaron Hernandez. A lot of characters that I think probably had some impact on that locker room. I'm just curious to hear what it was like in there. What was the dynamic like? That's one of the top things I want to hear about. Now, in that same vein... Tim Tebow during this time, he was larger than life. Like there's a lot of people that are just a few years younger than me that label themselves Florida fans. Some of them are from like Ohio, some from South Dakota. But the reason why, reason why they're Florida fans is because of what this team did and what Tim Tebow was, not just to college football, but to the entire United States of America. Like he was so visible and synonymous with college football that it was... It was something that I don't know we've, we've really seen since. The closest thing to it is maybe Johnny Menzel. But you take an icon like that and put him in college. <laughs> you put him in a spot where he's got to go to class and go to practice and be in the locker room with a lot of guys. Like, what was that like? What are the stories we got about Tim Tebow? He was portrayed as just like a psychopath when it came to working out. What are those workout stories like? He's got some of those in his book. What was he like in the locker room? Like, I think there are some people that have murmured and rumbled about how he was received in that locker room. Because I'll just say this, Tim Tebow, man, from the way that it sounds, and hopefully we get more insight on this in the documentary, from the way that it sounds, he is, how do I say this? Tim Tebow is Tim Tebow, right? Like, like Tim Tebow is not going to try and bend the knee at all to make you like him more. He's going to be him. And when someone is as assured of themselves as it sounds like Tim Tebow was, some people get rubbed the wrong way by that. Some people don't necessarily like that. It doesn't resonate with everybody. Now, I'm not implying anything. I think there was a podcast actually that had a former Florida player that alluded to this. But I'm just saying, I am very, very curious to hear about how Tim Tebow was in that locker room and just all the stories that I'm sure we're going to get about his time at Florida under Urban Meyer. And that's the last thing here. Urban Meyer somehow, some way, got this team with all of these players with different backgrounds and different ways that they turned out in their time after Florida to go and win multiple national titles. Like, that's saying something. How did this come together? How did you get Aaron Hernandez, Tim Tebow, Riley Cooper, Janoris Jenkins, the Pouncey Twins? How did you get all of those guys with different backgrounds and different just ways that their life went after Florida? How did you get them all to come together and just be a force on the college football landscape. How did that happen? I'm just fascinated by the, by the dynamic, the makeup of how you got this team to win how they won. Because I'll say this, it is so difficult to win a college football game. Like, I didn't play in the SEC. Some of y'all that are new to this show, 
I played in the Ivy League. I played at Cornell. And it is so difficult to win a college football game. I can't imagine what it's like in the SEC. I can't imagine what it's like to be able to push and scratch and claw every single Saturday and be as elite as they were to win a national title. Multiple national titles, mind you. So, Swamp Kings, August 23rd. Netflix ain't paying us a dime to talk about this, but for those of us that are college football fans and remember this period of time, to be able to peel back the curtain just a little bit and hear some of those stories that made this whole era what it was, I cannot wait. We get it right before the college football season. It's going to be a good time, man. I bet we'll talk about it as well when it rolls around, but I can't wait. Swamp Kings, August 23rd. Roll party roll. Appreciate everybody tuned in live, man. Appreciate everybody tuned in on podcasts. Like I, I say thank you a lot during the show because we genuinely are very, very grateful to have you all a part of this. I said it before. When I say program, I'm not just talking about the show. I'm not just talking about this side of things on the camera. I'm talking about all of us. Every single day we talk ball. Twice a week we got the live show, and we are enormously grateful for you all being tuned in and being a part of it. So thank you in advance for that, and thank you in real time for that, for those of y'all that are tuned in live right now. All right. Let's get to y'all's thoughts, man. Enough of me talking. Let's hear y'all's thoughts, questions, concerns. Bring it on now. Your mother's favorite producer, pride of Owensboro, Kentucky, heavy lifter extraordinaire, Nick Brake. Nick, how we doing, my man? What's up, JD? Uh, good seeing you, man. What's going on? Dude, I'm, I'm good, man. I know we, we talked a little pro football talk, you and I did yesterday, and we talked to Mike Florio yesterday. We're good, though, right? I mean, you and I, I just want to check in while we're, while we're on the air here. Yeah, we're not, I can only say yes, right? Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess. I guess if you weren't, you could. I mean, you could say we're not. No. If that's how we are, but that would. I mean, you know. We're good. Talk my more after the show. Look, I, college <laughs> football fans do not like Mike Flora. They just don't like NFL analysts either. You know. I think it's kind of. I mean, I know we're gonna get to the questions here. I think it's kind of like if you had someone in the college football space. Like, let's say you had uh, a Joel Klatt say something about Josh Allen that was negative. Or maybe Josh Allen's the wrong person to use there. I'd something about Bill like Bill Belichick. Belichick. And like yeah. just have a a take on him that is negative. Even if Joel Klatt is enormously informed, and he is enormously informed, as Mike Florio is to pro football, there's a little bit of a feeling like, hey, this isn't your thing. You know, like I think that's probably the, the, the reaction that college football fans were like, hey, this isn't your thing. You're pro football. Nick Saban's our guy. Like, even if you're a Florida fan, you're like, hey, leave Saban alone, you know? I think that was probably the reaction that, that Mike Floyd got caught up in. I get it. And I'll you say know? this. Look, Saban's the GOAT. I, I actually really like Nick Saban. But this just not act like he doesn't complain about everything, J.D. <sighs> another show for another time. Yeah, another show for it another sure time. Well, uh, first question. We, we go back and forth all day. We go back and forth all day on that one, Nick. I'm first not gonna question lie we got here. Trevor Collins uh, asked J.D., what are your takes on Sark's assistant hirings? Of Paul Christ. Did we get that right? Yeah. Yeah. Or P Paul Christ. Paul Christ. Yeah. Paul Christ. Okay. And then pay him set or sot. Or how do you say that? The hell defense. Okay. So just all in general, I'm so bad at saying names, Trevor. So I apologize. <laughs> uh, JD, what are your takes on Sark's assistant hirings to help with offense, to help with defense um, and special teams? He brought in uh, Joe DeCamillius, who won two Super Bowls. So what do you think, JD? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just start with the offensive side of the ball. Coach Chris, a former head coach at, at Wisconsin. To me, I think it is. I don't know if it's going to really change the like week to week for Texas. Like I think Texas, if Coach Christ wasn't the head coach, or excuse me, if he, if he never came to Texas staff, you probably have, you know, the same result. It might be one of those things where it just helps to have an extra set of eyes, like Gary Patterson helping last year. I have to imagine to help the defensive side of things for for Texas. I mean, you have a, a Power Five head coach you know, overseeing different elements of your program. I think it only helps. I mean, many hands make light work. So is it going to be enormously impactful that he's got these different assistants on the staff? I don't necessarily think so, but I also don't think it hurts. So that's my take on that one, Nick. I think it's always good to have extra eyeballs on the scene. Okay, we got a couple SEC questions. First, we're going to do Florida. Then we got something on LSU. Uh, but starting with Florida, Tyler S., Go Gators says, hashtag ask JD, does Florida win loss total affect the recruiting recruiting class in a major way this year? Or are the kids really not looking at the wins and losses, you think, JD? You know, I think it affects them to the degree of, and we said this yesterday on the one-off, like I really think that it's a trajectory thing for Florida. Like if I'm a recruit, 
I want to be developed. And also, I want to know that my head coach is going to be there long term. And I don't believe that Billy Napier, if they won five games this year, his buyout's like over $31 million, So you're not, I mean, if you're a recruit and you commit to Billy Napier, you're going to play for him next year. But in the long term, if I'm a recruit, I can't help but wonder like, hey, where's this going? So for Florida, I think improvement is like the number one thing you got to push for, which is, you know, sort of an obvious thing to say. Like if they win seven games next year, you can package that up, take it to recruits, and say, hey, we won six games the first year, seven games the next year, we're headed the right direction, come be a part of this. If you win five games next year, you say, hey, listen, we won six games, but we won five games the next year, and hey, come come help us build this thing. We just need the right guys. We need you in the boat. We need you a part of what we're doing here at Florida. And one of those pitches is a lot more enjoyable to make than the other, Nick. So I think wins, losses is a very real thing. I don't know if it's the only thing, but I definitely think it's a pillar that kids consider consciously or ups or, or subconsciously. Okay. Nice, JD. Um, next question. Sorry, I was looking something up. Uh, we got a question going from Bryce. Hashtag Ash JD. Thoughts on the LSU recruiting state right now and the state of, L- of Louisiana as a whole for recruiting. It always seems to get overlooked compared to California, Florida, Georgia, Texas. Uh, but Bryce says he believes the town's on par. What do you think, J.D., about that state? Yeah, you know, I think that's probably – we had uh, probably we had Brian Kelly on this very show, the head coach of the LSU Tigers, and he was pretty transparent. He's like, listen, it starts for us in the boot. we got to recruit Louisiana to get LSU to where we want it to be. And I think that's a very wise move by Brian Kelly. There's a ton of talent in that state, and it starts and ends with, with LSU keeping those guys home and, and playing for, for the Tigers. So I think the, the direction of LSU is absolutely the right way. I think Brian Kelly proved last year with landing a top 10 class that he can recruit, he wants to recruit, he will recruit. And at LSU, there's no reason not to recruit because of geographic location and also that brand. Like, Nick, those guys that grow up in the state, they've seen LSU for years. Like, they've they've wanted to go to LSU. They just need a reason to do it. And now Brian Kelly, with the place he's got LSU at, I think is going to be able to recruit pretty effectively and and have them in good position for years to come. Not just 2024, but for years to come. So I'm I'm definitely pro Brian Kelly, as many of you can tell. I'm curious, Nick, question for you. What what were you looking up? Okay, so... This person in our chat, um, Tony, says, fight on fan, JD? Interesting. Okay, so he thinks I'm a USC fan. Okay. He thinks I'm a USC fan. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Well, Nick, one, I appreciate That's you having my back. Means. Okay. Appreciate you having my back there, bro, trying, I, to, trying to make sure. I just don't know all of this college football lingo as much as I should. Um, I'm the guy behind the camera, you know. I, I need to know about camera shutter speed and stuff like that, not all of these different terminologies. So you're the heavy Google lifter, Google is my friend, and, of course, you know all of these, so I should just ask anyone. No, you're good, man. We're going to just keep immersing <laughs> you in this culture, and you will be a lifer before you know it. Uh, uh, I should. I'm yeah. not a... USC fan however I did grow up in Southern California and USC was a team that I was exposed to a ton growing up I mean I grew up going to the USC spring game and seeing Matt Barkley I mean I was there when college game day was there for the Stanford game and I mean so I have friends that went to USC I do not claim USC as like the team that I root for but I think it's fun when you see teams on the west coast doing well so I'll, I'll root for USC to do well I'll root for Oregon to do well like I think when whenever we can have college football be a nationwide sport and be and be relevant nationally I think that's good for the health of the sport and having everybody engaged so nice. not a USC fan but I do like to see the Trojans and our other West Coast brethren doing good things best coast best yeah. coast West Coast man I'm telling yeah. you okay I'm telling you it's a real absolutely thing. um got a lot of questions still JD do you have time for like three more Three more, man. Let's do it. Okay. Three more. This one coming from Michael Hartz. Hashtag Ask JD. Will we ever see another family with as much generational hype for a recruit as the Mannings? I remember seeing articles about Arch when he was in the eighth grade. That's unprecedented, JD. That's wild. Eighth grade. That's wild, man. And I mean, I think some of that, too, you kind of invite by saying, hey, your last name is Manning, and also, by the way, you're going to play quarterback. Like that's, I mean, there's some degree of, you know, what you're getting into whenever you line up at quarterback and your last name is Manning. So will we ever see more generational hype? I don't know. But Nick, I'll say this, man. Tom Brady's got some kids. Yeah. 
You know, like, hey, I'll just say if, if one of Brady's kids ends up playing quarterback and maybe he ends up having some ability, like it's going to be impossible for us not to at least look at that and say, well, maybe he's like his dad. Maybe he's going to be a success as well. So I, I will say this, though, too, with Arch Manning, like there's so much made about his last name and so much made about, you know, the the projection. But like everything with Arch Manning still is is very, very real. Like, this whole notion that he's a three-star if his last name wasn't Manning, like, that's just garbage. And if you think otherwise, Kirby Smart is not a guy that wastes his own time. He wanted Arch Manning. Nick Saban, not going to waste his own time. He wanted Arch Manning. So if you need more proof that Arch Manning is, is not just his last name, give whatever last name you want to him, and those schools still want him. So yeah. the last name probably doesn't hurt, but I will say it's, it's definitely a real thing when it comes to the Arch Manning hype. Absolutely. Um, J.D., this next question, I gotta find. Okay, I found it. Sorry, I was like, yeah, I found it. Brandon asks, hashtag ask JD, how much pressure, how much pressure, if any, is on Carson Beck to rise to the expectations of leading Georgia back to the national title? Man, I think it's enormous pressure. I really do. I mean, anytime you're the quarterback for the back-to-back -back national champs and you take over for a guy that was the GOAT in Athens, Kirby Smart's words, not mine, like there's going to be pressure. So is there pressure? Absolutely. I don't think there's the pressure in the sense that they're going to ask it to be all on him. Like if Georgia lost, you know, let's say 80% of the defense and they didn't have Brock Bowers coming back, like maybe there's more pressure for Carson Beck to perform, but He's going to trot out there. It's going to be a pretty manageable schedule. He's going to have a lot of great players around him. He still has pressure to do his job, and don't get it twisted. If they don't achieve the ultimate goal of winning a third national title in a row, there will be some heat that comes his way by nature of being the quarterback. But the pressure is real, but I don't think it's going to be a thing where, hey, Carson Beck, we're going to get on your back, lead us to the promised land. Still got a lot back on the defense. Still have Brock Bowers. Still have four guys that started games for in the offensive line last year. Like they still got a lot around him to where they're not going to ask him to do it all. But yeah, there's definitely pressure anytime you got that G on your helmet and you're the yeah. starting quarterback. JD, man, I look, we're running a little over, but we've got two questions. Is that okay? Let's do it, man. Let's, okay, let's, let's knock them out, baby. I had a question from Bryce I really like, but then Sean Nelson, the GOAT comes back and says, J.D., can you please get to my question? So we're going to do that one first okay, and then there we ask go. Bryce's. Um, Sean says, do you think Deion Sanders is going to come to the state of Nebraska and recruit players to join him in Boulder? Man, no shade on the state of Nebraska. I don't think that's where Deion Sanders is going to look. I think he'll look in Florida. I think he'll look in California. If there's some good players that he would like in Nebraska, I don't think it's – out of the question that he would go there, but I don't think Nebraska is going to be like the recruiting ground for, for Colorado. Good question though, Sean. I like it. Good question. I mean, and Hey, uh, Nebraska is trying to lock, lock down their guys in state. I think that's smart, but I don't think it's a place that Colorado is going to be, you know, extra pressed to try and, you know, make a point to, to own that state. Yeah. But we appreciate Sean, man. A regular. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Bryce, Hashtag ask JD, what game day experience have you not been to that you want to visit? Maybe even this season. Ooh, that's a good one right there, Nick. That's a great one. We'll end with that one. Before we answer that, got to give our, our shout out and our props and our love to the keeper of the queue, Nick Brake. Spinning the plates, searching things, getting to the keeper or getting to your questions like, does it all, true utility player. And very, very grateful for you, Nick. Thank you for making this happen, brother. Thanks, man. I'll see you on a Thursday. Thursday it is. Again, Nick break. Nobody better in the game. This is a great question to end on because we're going to hit the road this coming season, and I can't freaking wait. There's a lot of places we want to get to. The one place that always gets brought up, well, there's two places. One is the Penn State wideout, which has to be on the list. But I think the one that really, really gets talked about a lot is Baton Rouge at night. Death Valley for a night game last year. You saw Alabama go in there and lose in overtime. I think that's a environment that just has so much hype around it, that has so much buzz around it, and it has its own reputation to where if we don't get to Death Valley at night this coming season, with how close it is, we could just drive it like I failed y'all. So Death Valley at night, haven't experienced it, need to experience it. And when we do experience it, I hope to see a lot of y'all there. Again, this has been the hard count. 
I'm JD Pakel, Nick Brake Lifting Heavy. Make sure you're subscribed. Like the video on the way out. Gosh dang it, less than 100 days away from college football. Freaking love y'all. We'll see y'all on Thursday. We're going to keep this party rolling. We'll see y'all next time.